All right, folks, welcome in to Pickaxe and Roll, brought to you by our good friends over at Superbook Sports. I am your host, Ryan Blackburn, at NBA Blackburn on Twitter, part of the Mile High Sports Podcast Network. And I am here, not necessarily excited, but I am here to discuss last night's Denver Nuggets loss as the Phoenix Suns, uh, they defeat the Denver Nuggets final score 104 to 97. Uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, good morning to Cedric, who's in here just filling up the chat. Appreciate you. Uh, good morning to Dr. Van Nostrand. Uh, I you know we're sort of into the afternoon here, but having a good time regardless, doing everything that we can uh, to cover this Denver Nuggets team the best way possible. Thank you so much for hopping in and joining in. If you're new to the program, make sure to like and subscribe to the channel down below. I like to go live uh, pretty much four times a week. That's my general uh, goal with, with this particular podcast. And sometimes I will also go with Swipe Up, my guy. He's going over the weekends and he'll be back in town here relatively soon. We'll be able to do some in-person studio production, which should be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to that for sure. Uh, we do a lot of great content on the Denver Nuggets, and obviously I've been pretty central on, on the Mile High Sports YouTube channel, so make sure to go give that a like and subscribe. Really appreciate everybody for stopping in. Um, all right, let's get into the podcast. Let's get into everything. Um, Really appreciate everybody for uh, for being a part of it. The Denver Nuggets, obviously, they struggle. They definitely struggled last night. A pretty tough, pretty tough game for Denver, as they could have potentially gotten that done, but didn't shoot very well. Clearly did not shoot very well in this one, and that was a big storyline for this Nuggets team, for this Nuggets game. Phoenix held Denver to 97 points, but it was on Denver shooting 10 of 40 from three. Uh, Denver got down basically in the early first quarter and struggled to sort of dig themselves out. They did for a little bit, but then at the beginning of the second quarter, that's where I thought the game was sort of not lost, but really put into a tough position for Denver to win. And that was where you, you start to realize, hey, man, Zeke Naji, DeAndre Jordan, guys like that, they could be pretty helpful where Peyton Watson has to play backup five for Denver. That was not necessarily, I, I think, something that Michael Malone wanted to do, but Zeke Naji's been out. DeAndre Jordan, probably not the mobile big that you're hoping for to play against a team like the Suns where they're going to go with Kevin Durant as their backup five in a moment where Yusuf Nurkic is out. And they also played Thaddeus Young, the, the Suns did. And I was pretty impressed with the way that Thaddeus Young played. They've got an interesting mix that could give Denver some issues, uh, especially with their bench unit. But that, that group kind of goes down and it doesn't feel very good. And Denver, they try working their way back towards the middle of the second quarter, but not enough shots are going down. There are plenty of opportunities for Denver to get back into the swing of things, but it just never really happens. And Denver, unfortunately, goes down, and they, they stayed down pretty much for the entire game. Uh, I think they were down by about 9, 10 at halftime, and that was basically what the margin was for the entire rest of the game, other than... Um, other than like kind of the, the middle way through the third quarter where Denver basically goes down 15, 16. And it felt like the Suns were in control for the entire time. And Denver, despite the fact that they had opportunities, they had open shots, they had the occasional three that went down. The Suns just continued to make the bet. They continued to make the bet that the Nuggets were going to hit the, were not going to hit the threes that they needed to. And that was exactly what happened. They doubled Nikola Jokic. Throughout much of the game, Jokic waited for the double. He didn't really attack aggressively before that double came. And that's something that I think you could see changing in a playoff series. But it was very clear to me that Denver was either going to win or lose this game with their three-point shooting. 
And unfortunately, Denver goes 10 of 40 from three. In this game, Nikola Jokic had 10 assists, but I posted on Twitter earlier today. They had like he had 23 potential assists in this game, which is a high water mark for him. Usually the potential assists that he throws out there are converted by Denver, whether it's the kickout threes that are wide open, whether it's the dump offs around the rim, cuts, things like that, the two man game with Jamal. Usually those potential assists are converted upon. And he has one of the higher conversion rates in the entire NBA for when he sets up his team because the, the assists are generally very good. They put the team into a great place to succeed. Last night, it felt like he was. It felt like he was the point guard for a lot of the time where, hey, I'm just going to move the ball around the perimeter to the open shooter. And that guy's either going to make a play or he's not. And. I didn't think it was a great game from Nikola Jokic. I thought that he was very passive. I thought that he was more than willing to allow the game to come down to whether Denver was going to hit their threes without Jamal Murray. And I'm not sure if that was the right course of action for him. I don't think it was, obviously. I think that there were certainly some things that they could do better and certainly a little bit more aggression that he could have put into the game in terms of getting to his spots, getting shots, putting pressure on the Suns in the paint, and then helping Denver get some more shots around the paint with with cuts and things like that, with offensive rebounds, which Jokic didn't have an offensive rebound last night. That's a pretty telltale sign that he wasn't super engaged within the paint. And to be fair, Drew Eubanks did a nice job against him. But Thaddeus Young also, like, like that was just... Thaddeus Young should not have been able to win his minutes by 15. Bull Bull played great in his minutes off the bench. Some of this is to do with Denver's second unit, so I'm not going to put it all on Jokic or anything, but Eubanks played 27 minutes and was a minus 11. I think that if Jokic had pushed on that pressure point just a little bit more, they might have broke. I think the Suns might have broken down a little bit more and the fact that he didn't go to that I think was a pretty big sign that it was just uh, not the level of aggression that Denver needed in this one and to be fair Denver doesn't need this game they didn't need this game to get the one seed they got lucky in the standings but I know that they don't necessarily care about the one seed specifically They want to get healthy. They want to play healthy. And I think that asking for the effort to be super high through 82 games is probably not the right call for a team like Denver that can go into any building and feels pretty good about their ability to win a couple games or at least take one of the two in his playoff series. So they're not exactly concerned about it, although they'd like the one seed. We'll get to that conversation in just a second. But Denver obviously goes 10 of 40 from three. The Suns shoot uh, 48.5% from three. They get 16 of 33. And so they outscore Denver by 18 from the three-point line when Denver's attempted seven more of them. That's not a good sign. That's obviously not something that's great. Denver didn't shoot well inside the arc, but they shot a little bit better uh, given the the proportion of threes that they took. Um, They basically shot about the same as the Suns did. And they actually forced a lot of turnovers against the Suns. They held Phoenix to 104, despite the fact that they shot 48% from three. I thought that Denver's defense, for the most part, did a really nice job and did a much better job in the second half, especially where Phoenix scores 59 in the first half and then only scores 45 in the second half. Denver's defense tightened up a little bit and they forced a lot of turnovers and they put themselves into a good position where they could make some plays. But they didn't make the plays, and I thought that Michael Porter was pretty central to that. He had plenty of opportunities to hit some threes, to make some plays. He got a shot blocked at the rim by Kevin Durant a couple times. Reggie Jackson was bad, just flat-out bad in this one. 5 of 14 from the field, 1 of 7 from 3, 11 points and 3 assists, and was a minus 11. Um, And then the bench. The bench is the, the real kicker here. No Zeke Naji, no G. Andre Jordan playing in this one. 
DeAndre could have played, but it was a coach's decision as to not play him, which I thought was interesting. Peyton Watson plays the backup five for the first half and really struggles, not necessarily matching up with Kevin Durant, but then because like, he, he got a block on Kevin Durant, he contested his shots reasonably well. But it was about the rest of it. And when Denver plays a lineup that features Justin Holiday, Christian Brown, Julian Strother for four minutes, and Reggie Jackson, the rebounding is not exactly going to be good in those minutes. And guys like Royce O'Neal and Thaddeus Young and Bull Bull even were impactful grabbing offensive rebounds and converting that into second chance points in that moment. And other than that, like Denver played a pretty solid game. They only, like again, they only allowed 104 to a team like the Suns. That is a very dangerous offensive team. The problem, of course, is that Denver scored 97. And in those early second quarter and fourth quarter moments without Nikola Jokic on the floor, Denver basically scored a combined six points in about nine to ten minutes. And that's obviously not going to get it done. It's not. like <laughs> It's going to be very difficult for Denver to keep up with a team like the Suns, especially when the shooters in the starting lineup weren't very good either. So Denver, like Jamal Murray obviously was missed. Jamal Murray in this game was definitely missed. You could see Denver needing somebody to create better shots, to create better opportunities. Reggie Jackson is just a a heavy burden for him to bear. And then in the minutes where Reggie went to the bench and Colin Gillespie was out there with the starters, We've seen him have a good impact with Denver starting unit before. And frankly, Con Gillespie was a plus six in his 16 minutes. It wasn't his fault that Denver lost, but he also like had some moments where Denver could have capitalized a lot better in those stretches, uh, whether it's just making some of the open shots, defending a little bit better. I thought that Colin had a couple of good defensive plays, but there were also plenty of times where the Suns Try to take advantage of his size. And I'm very curious as to like what it, what the point guard rotation looks like in the playoffs if Jamal isn't going to be able to play 40 minutes. Like if he plays 30, say he gets hurt, gets into foul trouble. Is Reggie just going to take the other 18? They're going to tr- like they can't play Colin, nor that nor do I think that they should. Do they go with KCP as the point guard? There was a stretch where they played KCP at the one, they played Peyton at the two, and then they played Michael Porter, Aaron Gordon, Nikola Jokic. Do they do with that with Christian Brown, who I thought was better than Peyton Watson last night? Not by much, because neither of those guys were very good. Do they get a little bit more creative and maybe play Justin Holiday as a guy next to KCP and just go with those two? Um, two veterans that they can trust at the same time to fill in those minutes. I'm curious. I'm curious to see what they decide to do. But overall, just not a good night for Denver last night. They dropped that one, and fortunately, they sort of benefited from OKC losing. And so they didn't actually lose ground in their race for the one seed because OKC lost as well. Now, Denver, given that they were mostly healthy, given that they still had an opportunity to like play at home and play with Jokic and Aaron Gordon and Michael Porter, you think that they would be able to like, you think that they could make up some ground and and, like take advantage of a moment where Shea Gilgis Alexander had to sit, but that wasn't the case. So when we come back, we are going to chat about the Suns. We're going to chat about the team that Denver faced a little bit more and just how they approach that game and if if the Suns are actually a threat to the Nuggets or not because we've, we've seen a lot of takes on online. We've seen a lot of takes from a lot of people and I'm going to share mine in that regard. But first, everybody, this podcast, as you know, it's brought to you by Superbook Sports, the most trusted name in sports gambling with a direct line to Las Vegas. And now you can use the promo code Mile High and score up to 250 bucks with their first bet bonus. Win or lose, Superbook will match your first bet up to $250 with promo code MILEHIGH. Download the Superbook Sports app, enter the promo code, and you'll get $250, courtesy of Superbook Sports. Visit Superbook.com for terms and conditions. 
gambling problem, call 1-800-GAMBLER. We'll be right back on Pickaxe and Roll. And we're back. Pickaxe and Roll, Ryan Blackburn here. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning into the show. Really appreciate all the love and support, obviously. Uh, if you can, leave a like and subscribe to the video on YouTube. And if you are on the audio side, thank you for listening in. Thank you for tuning in. As, as always, that's where I generally listen to my podcasts. I'm not really a YouTube podcast guy. I, I tend to like the the audio format. Although, Mind the Game, the new podcast by LeBron James and J.J. Redick is sort of testing that theory because they provide so much uh, detail in terms of the plays that they are going over that I sort of need a visual like indicator to always kind of remind myself what they're exactly talking about of the terminology and the uh, just the examples that they use. So that's a good podcast. That's a good show. I, I think that we need more of that, not just from players, but from just general media as well. All right, let's go over the Suns and if they're actually a threat to Denver. So going by the box score, uh, obviously Yusuf Nurkic does not play last night, but he's had a couple of good games against Nikola Jokic. And Jokic himself has not had a lot of good games against the Suns this year. He's three three games, three subpar performances from Nikola Jokic. And I wonder if that has something to do with like Nurkic and Eubank specifically. Is it the scheme that they are running? It is interesting that Frank Vogel, the coach of the Suns, obviously the coach of the bubble Lakers that gave Denver and Jokic specifically some issues. I wonder if there's some correlations there. And if Frank Vogel just has some not insider information, but just a, a way to not rattle him, but, but imparting some wisdom to disrupt and Jokic. I don't think that he was like, I thought that he went away from what could have worked. I thought that if he wanted to do, to do the hard work, he certainly could have. He shot 9 of 16 from the field, which isn't that bad in and of itself, but only 1 of 5 from 3. He was trying to get the three-pointer going. That wasn't obviously working. 8 of 11 from 2, though, and he only had one turnover and 10 assists. So I think that he probably should have pushed it a little bit more inside, see if he could have drawn some foul calls only shot three of three from the line. And that to me is a pretty strong indicator that he's just not comfortable was that he sort of went away from being in the paint. And any time that you can sort of disrupt what Jokic is doing, you have to feel good. If you're the opposition, you have to feel good. If you're the, if you're the opposing team, the opposing center, because Denver's plan a is often, Hey, we're going to get the ball to Jokic and we're going to let him make decisions. And usually Jokic's decisions are fantastic. And I don't think that they were bad last night. I just think that they're kind of the easy decisions to make where he probably has to make the harder decisions and try to get into the teeth of the defense a little bit more and be a little bit more physical. I don't think he was physical enough last night. And that was really the key factor for why Denver only scored 97 because they had to take 43s with the way that Jokic was playing. He was kicking the ball out consistently, was finding the open guy, but only took like two shots in the first half and the first quarter took him a while to get going in the in the second quarter and then try to get more aggressive in the second half because he was like, oh, I guess we're losing. Um, So that's the first part is that the Suns, I think they do a legitimately good job, at least in the regular season of disrupting what Jokic does and what he wants to do. And so given that. They already have a leg up on a lot of other teams, which like OKC is not going to disrupt them too much. Even though like he's had turnover, like high turnover games, he's had games where he hasn't been super aggressive going to the paint, despite the fact that he's got a size advantage. Um, And then there are other matchups, like if you want to go to the Lakers or the Warriors or any of the other like. Dallas just recently was pretty disruptive to him. I don't think that that's going to stick, but they were. And Sacramento is like a team that has not had success, but they've also been kind of disruptive at times too. So it is curious that you see a lot of these playoff teams, and I can think back to plenty of matchups where Jokic has been kind of disruptive. 
But the difference between them and the Phoenix Suns is that the Suns have these three... I I don't want to say dynamic, because two of them are dynamic and the other is Bradley Beal. Two dynamic creators in Kevin Durant and Devin Booker. The Nuggets are pretty comfortable defending them in pick and roll specifically, unless they get the ball to the weak side shooters where guys like Grayson Allen and Royce O'Neal have done a pretty good job so far this year of hitting the shots that they're supposed to hit. And Bradley Beal, I'm sure, would be in that situation as well. Anytime the ball gets rotated to Kevin Durant, he is liable to shoot. And he's hit his threes. Devin Booker like didn't hit his threes in this last game. I, I think that he went, he went two of six. He went five of 17 overall, but had nine assists and was creating good opportunities for his teammates. Bradley Beal, seven assists, same thing, like creating a a good amount of opportunities. Grayson Allen is the primary beneficiary for that. He's been shooting extremely well, and the Nuggets can't leave him. That's the thing. It's like they cannot leave Grayson Allen open because he's been one of the best spot-up shooters in the NBA. And so you kind of get down to it, and let's say Nurkic gets back. He's doing a good job of facilitating and creating open shots for the teammates, things like that. If they run high pick and roll with Devin Booker and Yusuf Nurkic or Kevin Durant and Yusuf Nurkic, they're always going to find an open three if they want it. The question is if if they're going to want it, but the Suns, and Matt Moore was pointing this out to me last night, they were more aggressive in taking threes earlier in the game than they usually would have. Usually, the Suns would be abusing the tough twos. Tough twos don't beat us over 48 minutes. It's funny. Like Phoenix can actually say the same thing to Denver now after what happened last night. The Suns created good shots. They created pretty good shots consistently, and it was clear that that was part of their game plan. They, they wanted to get threes up, and they did. And Grayson Allen, to his credit, did it now multiple times in a row. Kevin Durant shot it well from anywhere that he wanted to. But he shot 12 of 20, which means that he was like, and he shot three of four from three, which means that he was nine of 16 from two. And so a lot of those are on the tough pull up twos. If he can shoot those at a 53 or 55% clip or however much it was, then Denver's going to struggle because the Suns still got up 33 three pointers, and that is a good enough number against Denver. Now, can Denver limit those threes? I don't know. I don't know if they actually can with the personnel that the Suns have now. So much of what the Suns had last year in the playoffs was defensive options that they couldn't really go to as offensive guys. And then they had offensive guys that they couldn't really trust defensively, like a Terrence Ross or a TJ Warren or guys of that nature. Now they've got Grayson Allen and Royce O'Neal, two guys that I think you can at least trust defensively to execute the right thing. And they're benefiting from that. They are they are clearly benefiting from it. And I think that they're a better team than they were last year. They have a better system. They've got a better coach. I think Frank Vogel is a better coach than Monty Williams. I think everything that we've seen in Detroit sort of bears that out too. And getting DeAndre Ayton out there, out of there, I think that has really benefited them as well. Bradley Beal is not necessarily somebody that they could trust, and I think that there's going to be some problems with him specifically. But it wouldn't surprise me if he picks Booker and Beal, uh, Booker and Durant up in a game or two every series. And for a third player, a third star, that's what you need. You don't need anything too crazy. You just need guys that can step up every now and then. And I think they're going to get that from Nurkic. I think they're going to get that from Beal. I think they're probably a little bit more dangerous than a lot of Nuggets fans are giving them credit for. Now, can they defeat Denver? Can they actually do that? I don't know. Obviously, Jamal doesn't play in this last game. He didn't play in the first Phoenix matchup as well. In the second Phoenix matchup, let me just go to that box score here real quick. Um, Sorry, I'm not as prepared. Uh, as I, I was hoping for. That game went to overtime. Murray went 
28 points, 9 assists, 12 of 25. He was a net neutral in a game where Jokic was minus 13, where Gordon was minus 22, KCP was minus 18. And Denver's bench was actually positive in that moment where they probably like it's it's funny they they wouldn't go to the same bench that they did in that in that game. I think they would go to Justin Holiday instead of Reggie Jackson and Reggie played 16 minutes was a minus 7 didn't play as well. They'd probably go to Justin Holiday, they'd probably go to Aaron Gordon as the backup 5. I think Denver's bench would be even better and their starters would be a little bit better than they actually were where Jokic was disrupted a little bit, had seven turnovers, wasn't great. Um, Aaron Gordon didn't play that well. Like he actually, he really didn't play. That. He was minus 22 in 34 minutes, like just, and had three rebounds and seven points. So I'm not sure how much we can actually take from any of the three matchups and say, oh yeah, it's the Suns are going to give Denver problems. I think the matchups will evolve. The rotations will evolve. And Denver's going to provide a different level of intensity. Now, I will say is that the Suns, obviously, they were desperate last night. They're in a seeding struggle for trying to avoid the play-in. If you look at the standings right now in the Western Conference, the Dallas Mavericks have are 43 and 29. The Suns are 43 and 30. The Kings are 42 and 30. And the Lakers are 41 and 32. The Lakers have played pretty well. They have won five in a row and are seven and three in their last 10. And they're making up some ground. They're making up some ground in that, and they're potentially making this play and race pretty interesting. I think at this point that the Suns obviously were pretty desperate last night. Denver wasn't desperate. If they were desperate, they would not have played Peyton Watson as their backup five. Like that just wouldn't have happened. Julian Strother, like, played four minutes last night. He wouldn't have played in a game that Denver was really super desperate about it. Um, like this comment from Jonathan Stone. No spark last night. Nugs to parade around a, a giant cutout. <laughs> they need to parade a giant cutout of Jamal's flared nostrils when he's out. It's not just Jamal's talent that's missing when he's injured. Nobody else seems to have that fire. Yeah, there's something to it that like when you're getting punched in the mouth a little bit, you need guys that are willing to respond. And that's just one thing that Jamal would have really helped with. Like it just would have responded in a situation where he's matching up with Devin Booker, Bradley Beal, Kevin Durant. Like those three are extremely talented and Jamal wants to rise to that level pretty consistently. And he didn't have an opportunity last night because he wasn't out there. And then Reggie Jackson is just like between Reggie and Colin, like those guys combined for pretty much, I want to say like 43 minutes last night. Reggie played 29, Colin played 16. Okay, so they played 45. If you cut that number to 15 and say, okay, Jamal, you're playing 33 minutes. Feels a little bit different, right? Just feels like Denver would play a little bit better. Reggie, I think, is somebody that like Denver kind of has to trust in this situation. But Colin is just not somebody that they can really trust for bigger moments and like like tougher moments like that. And the Suns are tough. Like I think that they've proven that they can be a legitimately tough team for Denver to face. Now, the difference between them being tough versus being a threat in a playoff series, I think is fair. I think that the Suns can take another couple of games off of Denver in the playoffs. I am not sure that they can actually beat them in a series. I am not sure that they can actually like push it to seven or anything like that. I think that Denver, when they get down to it, there's just a different level of intensity and focus, and Jokic would be... Playoff Jokic is just different. He's just a different beast. And I know that if Nurkic is out there, it's going to be a little bit different because Nurkic actually does some good things. But I do think that like, Jokic would foul him out, just like he did in the second matchup. And the Nuggets would take advantage after that. Drew Eubanks has like, he's shown enough to me that he's a tough dude. Like he's He can be a Jock Lando. He can be a Jock Lando in a lot of these situations where Landale really helped Phoenix in games three and four and helped them win. A, he helped them win at least one of those games. And then Booker was just crazy in the other one. So I think that there's something to the Suns having enough to really 
yeah, I guess we can call them a threat. Like, we can call them a threat at this point. Are they actually going to win if you play this match? If you played this matchup 100 times, I bet that Denver would win 65 of the games in a playoff intensity. And the Suns would win 35. And so given that, like if you have enough of those games that just happen to be in a best of seven series where the Suns are just the better team, then maybe they could actually pull it off. But I just, I don't really see it. And I don't really see Jokic kind of stooping to that level and not being able to match up with Nurkic and Drew Eubanks. Like I just, I cannot believe that. It's not going to happen. And then Jamal is just another kind of layer to this. Like he doesn't let Denver lose either. Like he's had plenty of moments where he'll match up with those guys. He'll try to like be the best he can be. And if Grayson Allen is going to be the guy that's going to be pressuring him full court, it's a little bit different than Okogi, who is a more physical, athletic defender. It's a little bit different. Like if Bradley Beal or Devin Booker are going to do it, then that means that they're a little bit worse on the offensive end as a result. And Jamal's going to be pretty great in those matchups, I think. A little bit better than he was last year. If it's Royce O'Neal, that one's a little bit interesting. I'm very curious to see how that happens, but um, yeah, going to be going to be fascinating. All right, let's take another break. When we come back, we are going to chat about the West standings. I'm going to give my predictions for how I think the standings actually play out, and we can talk about whether Denver will get the one seed or not. But first, this message from Scott DeHuff. Hey, what's up? It's DeHuff. I love to have fun. So tune into my podcast, DeHuff Uncensored. I give on-filter takes on Denver sports, crazy news from around the world. Plus, you never know which one of my characters is going to swing by. Well, I hope one of them's your mother. Oh, Connery, mama is always here for you. What in the blue heck is going on here? So subscribe and get ready to laugh to DeHuff Uncensored anywhere you find podcasts. Follow me on social media at DeHuff Podcast. All right, we're back. Pick Axe and Roll, Ryan Blackburn here. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning into the show. All right, let's talk about the West standings and where they where everything currently is. I've got the, the West snapshot up here. Uh, so if you're listening on the audio side of things, make sure to tune into the video side of things at around the 33-minute the mark. Here is the West playoff snapshot. Denver currently leading the entire West at 51 and 22. Minnesota and OKC are both tied at 50 and 22. I still think that OKC has probably got the inside track to be the one seed, though, and we'll talk about why. Um, but as it stands right now, Denver has nine games left in the season, and their magic number to be a top six team to avoid the play in is two. So they just need to win two more games or Phoenix and Sacramento who are currently like seven, eight, but they're tied with 30 losses. If they each lose a game or something that Denver's like, they're going to avoid the play. And obviously they're, they're not in position where that's really a factor. The magic number for the top four seed is really interesting where Denver's magic number for that is three to be above the new Orleans Pelicans who are currently have 28 losses. Denver, because they have the tiebreaker with New Orleans, New Orleans can only get to 54 wins. So Denver needs to get to 54 themselves because they've already got the tiebreaker. So Denver's magic number for the top four is three. And their magic number for a top three seed uh, above the Clippers, it's technically five. But if they were to beat the Clippers, in the April 4th matchup, then it's basically like three as well. So Denver needs to win that one game. But if they did, then they're they're basically like they're gonna be a top three seed. It's it's all but guaranteed. They've got nine games left to go. They could do it by themselves. Um and then the magic number for the top one, I believe for all three of those teams between Denver, Minnesota, and OKC is 10. And the reason for that is OKC's got the tiebreaker over Denver. Minnesota's got the tiebreaker over OKC. And Denver's got the tiebreaker right now over neither of them. So Denver, they are currently ahead of the Thunder in the standings. But 
because the Thunder also have 22 losses, they control their own destiny. Like if if the Thunder go 10 and 0 the rest of the way, then they are the one seed, like regardless of what Denver does, because Denver could go nine and 0, and OKC would still be in the driver's seat. So that's why this last night's game was so big, because Denver got a break with Houston, who's now won 10 games in a row themselves, and I don't know if you saw it, they're they're at the bottom end of that play in bracket that I that I put up there. Houston's won 10 games in a row and they just beat OKC without Shea. Denver got a break there and they had a great opportunity to get some separation between them and OKC in the standings. That didn't happen. And so Denver, like Alex Smith says in the comments, they've got to win. They got to win against the Timberwolves tomorrow. Friday game, Minnesota coming to town. I don't think it's a national game. It should be a national game, but it's not. And Denver's got a great opportunity to play Minnesota in a situation where I think Jamal will be back. I think they will try to go get that game. Jokic obviously played 41 minutes in this last game against Phoenix, so Denver obviously wanted to go get it. Now, they didn't go all out because, like I said previously, Peyton Watson played four minutes at backup center, and that obviously didn't work. And the fact is that Aaron didn't play those minutes. So if they really wanted to, um, we'll see. Um, True teller, Jokic has basically locked up the MVP. Like even if Denver drops to the three seed, like if they win 56 games and Dallas wins 48 games, which is where I have them penciled in, eight games is too much of a margin. It just is. Like Jokic is going to win even if Shea is going to be the one now, if Denver really falls off, if they're like, okay, we only won 54 games, and like that means that they go three and six the rest of the way, then it's a little bit different because you don't wrap up things really well. But if Denver just plays like a normal brand of basketball over the course of these next nine games, then it's going to be fine. And you could tell me any of the numbers that you want to about what Luca puts up. It doesn't matter. Like, it just doesn't. The wins are, it's going to be drastically different. And because Jokic is also putting up history, like they're both putting up history. It's just different brands of history. Luka's carrying a heavier burden for his own team individually. And that team is worse, like by a lot. What made it different between Jokic's run in 2022 and Luka's run now is there was no like team like the Nuggets, where there wasn't a candidate like Jokic is this year, where he's also putting up historical numbers, putting up arguably better efficiency marks and like playing better defense and things like that. He's doing better things in the details than somebody like Luka is. And like back in 2022, the margins for Giannis and Embiid in terms of the actual win percentages that they had ahead of Jokic They were like one game, two games. This is eight. It's a vastly different mark. Just vastly different. Um, Yeah, no, I think think based off of what we've seen so far with the standings, Denver's got an opportunity to get the one still. But I do think that it's more and more likely that OKC gets the one just based off of what they've got going for the rest of the year. Here are the remaining strength of schedules. Because like I, I just put up the just put up the standings and I'll put them back up here. Remaining strength of schedules for each of these teams. Denver has the 23rd toughest strength of schedule remaining. So pretty easy. It's one of the easiest in the in the conference. Minnesota's got the 15th toughest. So average. OKC's got the seventh toughest. So they do have a relatively tougher strength of schedule. But when you just go look through some of their games and you look through the different matchups, like I think that they're going to go seven and three in their final 10 games. I think Denver is going to go six and three in their final 10 games. And so you put those together and you realize, oh crap, they're both probably going to finish with about 57 wins. And so if they finish tied, OKC wins. Okay, so he's going to advance. Minnesota, I think, is like they're going to be about six and four 
in their final 10 just based off of where the games are played, what's actually happening, who's playing against them. So I think that they're going to finish with 56. And I think that that puts them at the three seed. I believe that the Clippers will finish reasonably well and the New Orleans Pelicans, who were in a really good position. Like, I think New Orleans' schedule is pretty tough, even in comparison to the Clippers, who, like, New Orleans has the eighth toughest schedule, the Clippers have the 11th. Just the way that things are going for the Pelicans, they've been really hot lately. I think that they're going to fall off a little bit here. The Clippers have been not great. I think that they're going to be a little bit better to close the year than a lot of people think. So I think the Clippers will get the four. I think the Pelicans will get the five. And then currently projected, I have the Suns, the Mavericks, and the Kings all at 48 wins. And if they finish at 48 wins, if all three of them are tied, then I think that it is Sacramento that gets the six, but there's still some tiebreakers that have to fig- that you have to figure out between the three of them. None of those teams are a division winner, so that doesn't really come into play. And when you have a three-way tie, you kind of mix and match the head-to-head matchups. So there is still one head-to-head matchup between, I believe, Phoenix and Sacramento that needs to happen. So once that does happen, it will kind of help other things fall into place. But because of that, you've got one of those teams that's going to avoid the play-in, and the other two are going to be stuck, and they'll play each other in a play-in matchup. And if Denver is the two seed, as I predict, my guess is that they will face one of Phoenix, Dallas, or Sacramento. One of those three teams. And if that's the case, like that's going to be tough. <laughs> that's going to be that's going to be a very interesting matchup. Like if Phoenix is going to be the team that Denver faces in the first round, then I just made my points pretty clear. I think that they could take a couple of games off of Denver. And if they did do that, even if Denver did advance in the like past the first round, having to struggle with a first round opponent, it's not super exciting. Like it's just not because Denver last year, they were able to get out of Minnesota out of that first round series with Minnesota only playing five games. It got tougher as the series went along, but they never had to go back to Minnesota. And if they did, that would have been tough. If Denver has to play six or seven games, in a first round series against a team. And then they have to play like say they, they play against Phoenix and Phoenix actually takes them to seven games. Denver actually gets it done, but, but then you have to go to Minnesota or you have to play versus Minnesota and you get home court advantage in that, but it's going to be a bitch to play just because like, they're going to be pretty tough. They'll be battle tested after their first round series. They'll be very motivated and that will be another tough one. And maybe Carl Anthony Towns is back by that point as well. And so you've got a tough matchup there. And then you're probably playing OKC. You're likely playing OKC in the Western Conference Finals at that point. And do I think that OKC's guys will be pretty tired at that point and having not necessarily managed that? Yeah, that would be pretty tough. But think about that. Denver plays Phoenix, then Minnesota, then OKC in the Western Conference. Those are some pretty tough matchups. They just are. And if you're the Nuggets, you're probably not super excited about that. Now, are you hoping to have Dallas instead? Probably not, because you're playing Luka Doncic, and Luka could probably, and with with the way that Kyrie plays sometimes off of him, you could probably justify Dallas getting a couple games off of Denver as well. So, I don't think anything's going to be easy. Sacramento, if they are the team that actually drops, like they've got the fourth toughest schedule, not as tough as Phoenix, but they've got the fourth toughest schedule in the entire NBA with 10 games to go. If they are the team that drops and then they are the team that wins that play in game and and gets the opportunity to face Denver, then I think that's probably the best case scenario for Denver. I think that Denver matches up better with with uh, Sacramento specifically than they do with Phoenix and then they do with Dallas. Do I think Denver wins all of those matchups? Sure. But do I think that, um, do I think it's going to be a little interesting? Yeah, I do. 
Um, let me just read some comments here. Cedric says, I think we may be the one seed, Ryan. Um, would it be OKC as one if we're two? Yeah, it would be OKC as one. I think that Minnesota probably less likely to kind of stay above the totem pole than somebody like OKC is. But if OKC, like they've got a tough road trip here. They're they're in the midst of a five game road trip. And if they drop a little bit of an extra game on that, then I think people expect, then they could be the team that drops. Um, it is very convoluted. If I had to give odds on it, then I'd say that I'd put OKC at a 40% chance to get the one. I'd put Denver at a 30, like I'd put them at a 35% chance to get the one. And I'd put OKC at a 20% chance or 25. Yeah, 25 is the math to get the one seed on their side of things. Um, Minnesota, Minnesota, if, if that's what I said. Alex says, I'm starting to panic, Ryan. I predicted we get the three seed and we will play the Pelicans. Pelicans would be, Pelicans have played pretty well. I think Denver's just going to match up pretty well with them because Joker will match up well with Jonas Valanciunas. JV will score against Joker, but you just know that like Joker's going to score in that matchup because Jonas just doesn't really do anything to bother him. And they probably like even with Herb Jones and others matching up with Jamal Murray, I think that Denver just has an offense that is too unstoppable. Now, New Orleans with the way that Zion Williamson has played, with the way that they can match up pretty physically in the front court against Denver's forwards. Aaron Gordon's going to have to have a really big series in that regard, but I just, I, I trust Denver to get that done in that series. And I think that they could do that in five. I really do. So if they were to face the Pelicans, then great. So maybe the three seed is what Denver should want. Who cares if they have to go on the road and, and face Minnesota or, or OKC or one of those teams. Who knows if those teams are going to make it to the Western Conference Finals or to the Conference Semifinals? Like that's a that's a fair question as well. And last thing from Cedric uh, is Jamal going to be okay health wise? His health has been so crucial to us. They're going to give him the time that they need, and I think that it's more precautionary what they're doing right now. Obviously, Jamal is like he's warming up before games. He's trying to stay fresh. He's trying to stay ready. If he had to have played last night, I think he would have. I think he would have played. The question is whether he can survive a full playoff run without getting too banged up, without getting too injured. And that's a little bit more concerning. I, I would say that that's a little bit more concerning for sure. I think he can. I think he will. I don't think he's at that point where you need to worry too much. But I will say this. Jamal's health is going to be an ongoing issue not just for this year, but for the next couple of years, the next few years and down the line, like they're going to have to manage it. His body like is, is taking on a lot of hits, taking on a lot of, taking on a lot of stuff. So I think he'll play tomorrow. I think he will play in the playoffs. I think he's going to be great. I don't have any questions about that, but I do wonder on the next contract that he signs and just on everything that kind of comes with it. He's going to get worn down pretty quickly. So I hope that he continues to stay in great shape, do what he can, take care of his body as best as he can, and put himself into a position where he's got the longevity because it just wouldn't surprise me if some of these injuries, they take their toll. So we'll see what happens. All right. I think that's going to do it for this episode of Pick Action Roll, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. A little... A little long in, in for this podcast, and I wasn't really expecting that, but uh, thank you for tuning in. Hopefully, everybody is excited about what's to come. Denver should have a fun game tomorrow night. Uh, thank you to Snow Wolf for hopping in. Thank you to Cedric for hopping in. Thank you to Magic Bones for hopping in the chats and everybody else along the way. Really appreciate it. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button on the way out. I will talk to you guys very soon.